When you think about the fundamentals of the Christian faith, you may think about the Trinity or the resurrection or the forgiveness of sin, but you're probably not going to immediately think of Satan. Must fight Satan. Make it up to him. Later. Satan is a master of lies. Everything he says is the opposite. Of course not. I am not here to judge you or your boss. Satan! The man with the golden pitchfork. That's right. I'm talking about Satan! Hey everybody, thank you so much for subscribing, for commenting, for liking, for interacting in general. I put the links down below for the social media as well as our Patreon and all the other cool stuff. Uh, even things that I can't think of right now. A fun hobby for a lot of Christians is finding out what is evil about a movie or TV show. And they will find ways to make anything about demons and Satan. It's the devil's music! Little Mermaid movie is coming out, a remake of the Disney animated movie of 1989. And the movie is based on a fairy tale that was written by Danish author Hans Christian Andersen in 1837. Now, the idea that mermaids, witches in the water, spirits in the water is actually not far-fetched from the reality that the spiritual world is real. It's not far from reality? You know what is far from reality? Your view on what is reality. But sometimes they are deliberate, and they actually put images or have characters based on Satan, and that makes people even more angry. I'm as permissive as the next parent. I mean, just yesterday I let Todd buy some Red Hots with a cartoon devil on the box. Well, I think it's a further example of exploiting Christianity to make money, and in the process kind of uh, influence uh, vis uh, viewers to think of Christianity as somewhat ridiculous. I don't know if they need a lot of outside help there, but... Go on. By making the devil look like an attractive figure, I watched that uh, preview that Fox TV put out, and the devil is expressing a kind of sense of justice. He's outraged that someone's not going to be prosecuted for murder. That's a complete perversion of what we know the devil to be. He's the father of lies. He's a murderer. He doesn't rejoice in justice. He rejoices in destruction, mayhem. So um, this is an example where religion is being used to make money and to, in a real sense, mock the beliefs of Christians. I have a lot of friends who really like the show Lucifer, but I could never really get into it. I just can't get past the fantasy element of there being good cops. This particular show is called Pauline, and it's a German show. We don't know a whole lot about it, but we do know that the synopsis is that it's about an 18-year-old girl who falls in love with Satan, um, or has a one-night stand with Satan, so there isn't a lot you can find right now about this show other than the name and that quick synopsis. But of course that will never stop Christians from freaking out about something. What was your reaction when you first heard about this series? Well, I mean, my reaction was Satan always comes masquerading as an angel of light. And so he's going to portray himself in the form that people are most readily able to accept because he wants to appeal to the masses. He's not condemned to hell. He freely chooses hell. And even beyond that, we have to realize that in the, in the garden, he is depicted as being tempted by the devil. So even that free choice is conditioned by sin. So you have to ask, well, how free was he really able to do it? You know, you and I, we try to resist temptation and we fail. On and on and on we fail. Hopefully we get a little bit better at it, but we, we still fail because we're human. We have a broken nature. So it's very interesting here. It's not the judgmental people in heaven, though they, there are judgmental people depicted, who force him down to hell. He freely chooses hell. Wait a second here. In Christian tradition, who was the one who was tempted by Satan but didn't fall for it and then later went to hell on his own free will? Was that a bad person or was that... Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. But now seeing that he's literally flashed the word Satan up in a prior performance, can we ag agree that this was very intentional? 
Yeah, I think so. I just think that we're so, so quick as believers, as non-believers to be like, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like, don't be stupid. You, don't overthink this. Don't making, make this too big of a deal. Christians always making yeah. too big a deal about everything. And it's just like, just like there are Christians out there, there are Satanists out there. There are believers in the devil that literally straight up worship him. A lot of them happen to be in Hollywood, which is terrifying. <laughs> That sounds made up. The thing is, people are using satanic symbolism and Satan as a character not because they believe in it, but because the idea of Satan is so prevalent in Western culture, and that's because of Christianity. Satan isn't someone out there who is against Christianity. Satan is a key figure in Christianity. Because in order for Christianity to work, there needs to be a bad guy. Yes, God is perfect and wants the best for you, but also there is Satan, and he's out to get you. You need somebody to blame the bad stuff on, and you need to turn your hard times into a battle instead of just hard times. Many people will live their whole life and wonder why things don't go too well. They trust that Jesus Christ is their personal Savior, and yet they suffer one defeat after the other. Can't quite figure out why do not realize they have an enemy, an enemy that's very real, an enemy that's laughed at, criticized, disbelieved, but very, very real, whose goal is threefold, to draw us away from God, thwart God's purpose in our life, and divide us. Satan is a very real person. Notice it says he has strategies and tricks. Satan is subtle, Satan is strategic, Satan is smart. He's far smarter than you are. Hey Einstein, what's a million plus a million? So don't try to outsmart Satan. You're never gonna outsmart him and he's not afraid of you at all. Now that's the bad news, that you were born for a battle. The good news is you were born to win. But who is this Satan? What's his story? Because according to these people, he is very real. First things first, if you embrace Satan, who is a real person, you will burn in hell for eternity. Hell, which is a real place. We should establish that. You know what's actually a good way to establish things, right? To show evidence for that thing. People are going to joke about this and say, oh, here goes Michael. He's talking about some crazy religious stuff. I'm not. I'm just bringing you the facts. And facts don't care about your feelings, <laughs> as my, my colleague here loves to say. I would say that nothing screams the opposite of facts over feelings more than just decreeing that your religion is a fact and he is not a joke he is out to destroy us don't you dare laugh about him what you don't make jokes about him his strategy first of all is for you to miss him so if you're looking for somebody with horns a red jumpsuit and a pitchfork <laughs> you're looking for the wrong creature Satan is delighted when he is depicted as a cartoon creature with horns and a pitchfork. This makes him seem like a joke, a fairy tale, a figment of the imagination. Nothing could be further from the truth. Changed my mind. Sorry. Cool. Bart, stop pestering Satan. One, the devil is nothing to joke about. Uh, sometimes we like to say funny little things like the devil made me do it, or we think of him with horns and a tail. But the reality is he's not a cartoon character. He is a real being out to destroy you. Second Peter says that he's roaming around like a lion looking for people to devour. When somebody tells me, I don't believe in the devil, I think that's like being in a ring with a, a bunch of lions. And you say, no, I don't, I don't believe in animals. Or you could say that believing in Satan would be like being in a ring with lions and insisting that the devil is controlling the lions instead of figuring out an actual solution to the problem of the lions that are going to eat you. But if Satan is so awful and so dangerous and not a joke, why did God create him in the first place? Why would God create someone as wicked as the devil to begin with? Well, first of all, God did not create Satan as we know him today. That's right. God created him as a good guy. He was a good angel. That's God did not create Satan. God actually created 
Lucifer. So we have to understand that uh, the word Lucifer is a positive name. It's a beautiful name. It actually describes uh, God's most beautiful created angel of all time. It means the son of the morning dawn. Now the word Satan and the devil and other names are names that has been assigned or attributed to Lucifer as a result of him making the decision to turn away from God. And these words are more negative in nature, such as Satan means adversary and the devil and so on and so forth. So God created this being perfect. Oh, Pat, gone too soon. It's just so sad that hell isn't real. But what happened to him was, I can do it better than God. And that has been the sin of mankind ever since. I can do it better than mankind. I am more important than God. I am better than God. That's the root of all sin. And uh, pride is the greatest sin, and humility is the greatest virtue. If someone were to say, create a perfect car, and then that car immediately blows up, you may ask yourself if that was really a perfect car. As a high-ranking angel, he once well, was in a place of exalted glory. He was up there in the category of a Michael or a, a, a Gabriel. In fact, it says in Isaiah 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You were cut down to the ground. I just miss your mother so much. She was an angel that fell from heaven. Uh, yes, so was Lucifer. So there are two Old Testament passages that are used to tell this story about Lucifer falling from heaven. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So what happened? Well, he looked at himself and he also saw the things that God had said about him. Perfect in beauty, full of wisdom, perfect in his ways. But here is what marked that till moment. Instead of giving God as his creator the glory and credit and thanksgiving for his perfection, he began taking the credit for himself. But there's something interesting about how Lucifer and how Satan are talked about in the Bible and in these passages. Listen to how this guy talks about being a detective. Looking for the answer to where evil came from, we're going to follow the story of one of these angels. And we're going to be like detectives, getting clues here and there. And in the end, it will be very clear to us. Check out what the Bible says about this angel. In Ezekiel 28, verse 12 to 15. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were perfect in your way. That's because you have to pick apart the Bible and assign different people or different beings to Satan or to Lucifer or to the devil. There's not actually a lot in the Bible about Satan, believe it or not, in terms of his creation. We don't really learn about the angel split until Revelation chapter 13, right? Where a third of the angels go with Satan and the other two thirds stay with God. But yes, he creates these angels and one of them becomes a fallen angel and takes a third of the angels with him. He had the free choice to disobey God and decided to do so. Yeah, me and Frank Turk agree on something. It takes a long time for the Bible to talk about this, but it doesn't talk about it as a past event, but a future event in a book written by someone on an island in exile who was probably eating too many local mushrooms. Those Old Testament passages they are quoting are not talking about angels or the devil. They are talking about kings on earth, real human beings. Now, uh, as studying this text, you'll go back and you'll say in verse number four of Isaiah chapter number 14, take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. And of course, what you have here is a earthly ruler being addressed, but in a much higher plane than any human being could ever fit. No man on the face of this earth could ever meet the qualifications that you find in Isaiah chapter number 14. This is why the Christian church has for ages believed that the uh, the context, the greater context of Isaiah 14 is a reference to is a reference to uh, the devil, Satan, or Lucifer. And we're going to talk about all three of them in just a moment. Because they are using hyperbole. That's hyperbole. Lucifer wasn't a name. 
It just meant it was a bright light. And then they're like, oh, that's Satan. And oh, also his name was Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. And you try to piece together uh, this this uh, uh, existence, if you will, of some evil being. It just becomes very, very difficult in terms of how you interpret those passages. So. And then we have one of the first stories in the Bible, Eve getting tempted by a talking snake. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Crafty means sneaky. I fear you're underestimating the sneakiness, sir. Crafty means clever or shrewd. The snake, the serpent, was more crafty, sneaky, slithery than any of the other creatures God had made. So when Satan wanted to make his move, he chose something that would be consistent with what he wanted to achieve. He wanted to achieve craftiness, so he chose a crafty creature. Satan knows what to choose and who to choose to slither into your world. The story never says that the serpent is the devil in disguise. It only says that there is a serpent and that it talked. It wasn't Satan who was cursed, it was snakes. Mankind and then this one animal species. He directs our attention towards a need or desire. That's the way he always gets in. He starts out with that. For example, here's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Everything is absolutely perfect. Could not be better. They have everything. They have each other. Everything is perfect. The one thing that they didn't have is fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look at everything else is perfect. And so what does Satan do? He points them to the one thing they don't have. How many men and women point to some other person lustfully because they have everything else in life they need but him or her? But here's what we have to be careful with. Sometimes the answer the Bible gives is not the one that we want to hear. You know, sometimes the Bible's silent. And on this question in particular, I don't know that God has said, here's why I did it. You mentioned Job. We know God allowed Job's temptation. We know he experienced monumental suffering. But at the end of the book, when Job questions God, God doesn't say, Job, I did it to strengthen your faith or Job, I was doing it to punish you for your sin. Basically, what does God say? He says, I'm God, Job, and you're man. <laughs> Were you there when I created the world? No. And then it's, there's this silence. Now, that's not the answer we want, but we have to be careful that we don't put words into God's mouth in our attempt to deal with some of these difficult questions. <sighs> okay, yeah, okay, let's talk about Job now. The Bible's whipping boy. Job was punished for the crime of being grateful to God. He had everything taken away from him for a cosmic test. God was willing to destroy this man's life as a way to prove that Job would love him no matter what. You taste these tears. I know. Taste my sad, no, Michael. Gonna lick you. He allowed these things to take place in Job's life. It's not that God delighted in what he allowed in and of itself. Right, that's good. But yeah. he had a purpose for it. Mm -hmm. So it's not that God delights in evil. He doesn't. He hates evil, but he had a reason to decree the fall of Satan and the fall of man. There's, there's a, a, a greater end beyond the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And in that, God did delight in, mm -hmm. and his glory will be put on display. And mm -hmm. in that, we delight, mm -hmm. uh, even in the difficulties that we face. But did God make a bet with Satan, like as we would picture Satan today? The thing about the book of Job is that it has this character called Hasatan or the Satan, and that would not have been seen at the time as the Satan, the evil character we have today. The word meant accuser, 
and is referring to a being in God's court, like an angel or some sort of supernatural entity, whose job it would have been to challenge mankind and call them out on their BS. What we may call today, ironically, the devil's advocate. There's a story in Numbers 22, it's the other talking animal story in the Bible, where Balaam's donkey starts talking to him, and they're also stopped on the road by an angel. And that angel is sent to stop Balaam. And in this story, it specifically says that God has sent this angel, but it also calls the angel a Satan, an accuser. It's the same word used here in Job. This was someone, a being sent from God. This wasn't a fallen angel we see in Job. It was somebody who worked for God and would accuse mankind for God, which explains why he was able to just walk up to God and ask him questions. Thanks, Satan. Uh, it's Satin, actually. Got it. Lucifer is a name, all right? Devil is not a name. Satan is a name, but it's used both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the word Satan shows up in the Hebrew text just exactly as you say it. Satan or Satan. And it's translated as adversary, to hinder, to stop. The word literally means someone who gets in the way of or tries to alter or divert. That's a Satan. And so the Lord Jesus confronted Satan in the New Testament. All right. He confronted Satan. But by the time Christianity comes along, the idea of the devil and hell had been absorbed from other religions. But if you're here, who's guarding Hades? And the idea of God having a powerful enemy that we can blame the bad things on was borrowed from Zoroastrianism. There's an unseen war going on between good and evil, between light and darkness, between God and Satan. They are not equal enemies. Satan is far inferior. He's a created being. God's a zillion times more powerful than Satan. And one day he's going to wipe him out. So we have the New Testament full of stories about the devil and demons. And you have to insert that character into the Old Testament as often as you can. So Christians get a scapegoat for God. God made all the good things and Satan made all the bad things. But the existence of Satan also brings up some problems. Like... If God is all-knowing, then why would he create Lucifer in the first place? If he knew he was going to rebel and he knew that he would cause mankind to sin, why would he make this angel at all? So sometimes people say, well, didn't God know this was going to happen? Sure, he knew it was going to happen. That doesn't mean he is the cause of it, right? Any more than if I'm looking at a building and I see a plane that's getting ready to crash into that building. I know it's going to happen. I can see it happening, but I'm not the cause of that. I'm not the person that's driving the, or flying that plane. I'm not the person that put it into the mind and into the heart of the pilot to crash that plane into that building. So it is possible for God to know something and yet not be the cause of it. Now, maybe don't use an example where the person was doing a bad thing because they thought God wanted them to do it. Like, you're making the video, you're trying to defend religion, but you bring up a story where a person's religious beliefs cause them to kill a bunch of people. And he's also given an example where you know something is going to happen, but you also have no way of stopping it. This is a completely different scenario. Like, say you were building an airplane. Or, no, let's make this more uh, random. Let's say you're building a submarine. And you know that there are safety concerns. Employees raised safety concerns when the vessel was built, while lawsuit says the company did not perform adequate testing on the Titan's hull. And the head of the Marine Technology Submarine Committee says the Titan never went through independent testing. It was also never certified by an industry group, which is not required in international waters, but is industry standard. But instead of addressing those concerns, you fire the people who bring up the concerns. According to The New Yorker, David Lockridge, who was a former OceanGate employee who claims that he was wrongfully terminated for raising red flags, once sent an ominous email to a colleague about the doomed vessel, writing, that sub is an accident waiting to happen. He also added this about then-CEO Stockton Rush. He said, I don't want to be seen as a tattletale, but I'm worried 
He kills himself and others in a quest to boost his ego. And you work against keeping people safe and just make them sign a waiver saying that, hey, I agree that I might die. Metal submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? Then you take those people deep into the ocean. If those people die, then in that case, yeah, you're kind of responsible. Um, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And, you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. So if you know something is going to cause a lot of damage, or at least has the potential to cause a lot of damage, and then you create that thing and do nothing to stop it from causing that damage, you're at least partially responsible. But before I answer it, um, let's make sure that we agree that it's true, that God could take him out any time he chose. Because I think there's some who would say, um, he really can't because of rights or authority or independence or free will that Satan has. But the reason I know he can take him out without turning me into an automaton or breaking any rules is because he's going to take him out. When my stepbrother was a kid, he had a dog, and he would let this dog poo in his room. And then he would just scoop up the poo and put it in his waste paper basket in his room. I walked into his room once and mentioned how bad the smell was. And he said that it was the dog's fault. But I explained to him that he was the one who was letting his dog poo in his room. And then his solution to that was just to put that poo in the waste paper basket. And that was not a solution to get rid of the smell, even though eventually he would empty that can. He caught the shit poo. <laughs> but God can get rid of Satan, but insists it's fine that he will eventually get rid of Satan. God is all knowing, but the angels are not. They're created beings. So when there's one angel who sows a lot of doubts and confusion and mistrust against God's character, and all of a sudden, boom, God destroys this very angel. What would you think? Satan must have been onto something, right? So would you still continue to love God as you did before? Or would you be terrified, fearful that you could be next on the hit list? In other words, God would need to allow time for Satan's new principles to develop and to become visible to everyone who is not all-knowing like God is. Then all the created beings could see for themselves the destructive results as a natural consequence of diverting from God's design. But God smites people all the time in the Bible for the simplest thing. And this scenario makes it so God's only choice was to act after the fact, despite him saying that God is all-knowing. He didn't have to ruin his reputation or whatever. He simply could have not created the beings that would have rebelled. Why didn't God just destroy Lucifer and the fallen angels right then and there? If God would have destroyed Satan and his angels at that time, then the rest of the universe would obey God out of fear rather than love. Yeah, God doesn't want us to just believe him out of fear. And that's why there's never a threat of hell or torment after we die for simply not believing in him. We need to understand and accept the fact that whenever God created angels and also ultimately mankind, he created all of us with free will. Oh, get out your apologetics bingo cards, folks, and circle that free will square. He created us with the ability to choose, to choose to obey, to choose not to obey, to choose between good and evil. And if God God would have controlled Satan in such a way that it was not possible for Satan to choose evil instead of good, then God would also have been removing free will, which would have been against his original intent for creation. But he allows him to exist right now so people have a choice because it's not real love unless you can choose to not love somebody. And so God gives us a choice between good and evil. He's actually using that right now. 
The only problem here is it's really hard to love somebody who puts you in really dangerous situations just to test your faithfulness. God who lived all eternity, would you be happy living all eternity with robots loving you? If they were cool robots like Johnny Five. Hey, laser lips, your mama was a snowblower. And not whiny ones like C-3PO. I don't know what all this trouble is about, but I'm sure it must be your fault. See, you wouldn't be happy like that. You would prefer a real kind of person that has free will and free choice who chooses to love you. I mean, think about it. All eternity you live like that with robots loving you? You can't really enjoy that kind of a life for all eternity. Forever. Think about it. He had no beginning or end. If the reason he made us was simply so that he had people to love him, that's already pretty sad. I want to be married and have a hundred kids so I can have a hundred friends and no one can say no to being my friend. Then making it so they have a painful life because that way he knows for sure they love him just makes him cross over from simply sad to diabolically evil sad. God created Lucifer with free will. Lucifer then exercised that free will to choose evil instead of good. And at that time, his name was changed from Lucifer to Satan. But just because Lucifer chose evil rather than good does not mean that God was responsible for that evil any more than God is responsible for murder, right? If God creates a human being, God doesn't create a murderer. That human being makes the cause his choice to murder someone except he kind of does if god is an interventionist god who sometimes intervenes in mankind's history like christians believe and if he is also all loving and all powerful then yeah every evil act is an evil act that he could have stopped now the thing is this is that atheists what they like to argue is this what they like to argue is that Okay, man has free will to truly love God, but why does it have to be through creating Lucifer? Why do you have to have a person tempting you to do it? Not only that, why do you have to create the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Like deliberately right in front of their face. I mean, why would you do that to see if man truly loves God? He could have done other means. Why does it have to be something like this? Here's a simple question. Would you, would you in your right mind, to test if a person truly loved you, deliberately send a person to tempt that person? To put deliberately a thing that would damage mankind for all of his life and even in his eternity? Risk the soul to burn in hell forever? No, you and I would never do that. But why would God do that? See, God, he must be a very mean, sadistic, strange person, twisted kind of love. That's what the atheist is thinking. But here's the simple answer to that one. It's not really difficult. God is not the same thing as man. If man did it, then you have a strange, messed up kind of love. Do you know why? Because man, he is imperfect. So we can't judge God by human standards. Except for, like in the last video, we established that in Matthew 7 verse 11, it tells us that if you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts, to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? Which is the Bible telling us to judge God by man's standards? Then how much more will God? Now this is absolutely important for you to understand. That way you can debate with atheists successfully. Think of it this way, if you raise your children up with godly principles and one day they murder somebody or they turn away from you, is that your fault, right? Is Are you completely and totally responsible for the decisions that your children make? Completely? No. As a parent, you can't control what your kids do. But the way you raise your kids does have a huge effect on who they will grow up to become. I know a number of people who have gone no contact with their parents, and every single time, it is because of what the parents did. Sometimes it's because they were abusive, 
And sometimes it's because they are so bought into a religion, they refuse to accept their own kids for who they are. But yeah, you can't control everything your kids do. Absolutely not. In the same way, God is not responsible for the decisions that we make. God does not control the, the things that we do because if he did, he would once again be removing free will, which is against what he uh, initially intended for his creation. Also, as someone who doesn't personally want to have kids, Let's be real here and admit that there shouldn't be social pressure for anybody to have kids if they aren't ready or they don't want kids. And maybe God just wasn't ready. And his decrees with full knowledge, knowing that he will create this being who will rebel and then tempt others to fall. It was ultimately to bring about uh, the plan of, his, of the divine son uh, being, being magnified which gives greater glory to, to the Godhead, uh, not only through all of human history, but also for all eternity. Yes, and greater, greater glory, not in the sense of giving him something he didn't possess already, but putting on display what he already possessed. Yeah. Wait a second, are you saying his plan was crucifixion all along? I thought that was to fix the problem, not the actual goal. Why did Christ have to die? Because we fell. Why did we fall? So that Christ would die? But why? You still haven't told me why. Um. Oh. And that the, the story we get from Genesis to Revelation is the greatest story ever told. Somebody's never watched Doctor Who. There are no stories in the end. Just make it a good one, eh? And that whole plot, that whole story, wouldn't be there. Uh, unless God had, had chosen to glorify himself in his son, redemption is a greater work than creation. Yeah. And God glorifies himself more by our salvation uh, than he does even in creation itself. Mm -hmm. that I thought we had free will. How is it all part of God's plan for redemption if we also have free will? Paradise lost in Genesis, paradise regained in Revelation, everything in between is a story of redemption, and the Redeemer is Jesus. He's the center of the entire Bible. So he lives the perfect life and takes our punishment on himself so he can redeem us. He could have created a world where we were robots, but that wouldn't be a moral world. Hey, do I preach to you when you're lying stoned in the gutter? He could have prevented Satan from sinning, but if Satan is a free creature, then it's logically impossible for God to allow freedom to be controlled by him, because that's not what freedom is. Freedom is freedom. You get to do what you want to do, within certain limits, obviously. Who sets those limits? So we all have the freedom to either love or to hate. God wants us to not sin, but he doesn't want us to be robots. But also... One day we'll be in heaven and we won't be able to sin. Even though Lucifer was in heaven and he was able to sin. He wants us to freely choose him or he'll punish us. We have to worship him on our own, but also one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Perhaps the other thing I should say is that he sent his, he sent his son right into the middle of this satanic warfare. And it was Satan that put it in the heart of Judas to betray him. So Jesus exposes himself to the horrors of Satan's deceit and lie and murder. He's a murderer from the beginning and a liar and dies in order, it says in Colossians 2, 15, to make a public display of the principalities and power in his defeat of them. There is more glory that will come to Jesus Christ because of suffering to destroy Satan than powerfully shooting Satan in the head. There are things God has revealed and there are things that he hasn't. Yeah. There, are, there are things that he tells us about because he wants us to know those things. And there are things that belong to him that we will never know mm -hmm. about. Deuteronomy 29, 29, that's a, a good passage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And and so one of the greatest disciplines we will learn as Christians is to be content with what God has revealed. And this is something we'll be mocked over, I mean, by the world. 
Could I, therefore, be made the subject of fun? I guess so. You know, we're, we're just simple Bible believers. But now as a, as a Christian for many years and as an older man, I can tell you I am absolutely content being a simple Bible believer. Percent. Is he 100% perfect? Yes or no? No. A perfect creator would not be capable of creating an imperfect creation. That shows an imperfection. Yes, otherwise there's no such thing as God. Well, that settles that. Period. God would not be God unless he's 100% perfect. Now here's the thing. As a 100% perfect God, are not all his ways perfect? Amen. Absolutely. Will he make it 90% or 99% or will he make it 100%? He will make it 100%. So in all his doings, he has to be 100% perfect. And it's without sin. If God is going to really show if you really love God, you know how he's going to do it? He's going to do it in a perfect manner that's 100%. You see that? The best way that can truly expose the heart of man that where he 100% loves God is that you bear it all open. You bear it all open, find the thing that causes man not to love God, and go through all of that mess. Go through all of those things to see if mankind truly loved God or not. At the very least, this God he's describing is abusive. He's setting traps, and he's sending monsters after you because he wants to know for sure that you love him. And I can tell you for certain that I cannot love someone who would do that sort of thing. So it's a good thing that we already established that this God can't exist. There's no such thing as God, period. And all of that, that the glory of God, his mercy, his justice, his grace, his wisdom would shine more brightly. And we can argue with that. We can say, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't think God should run the world this way. And if we ultimately disagree, then we will reject God We'll reject the biblical testimony and we will perish forever in hell and i choose to trust him and there it is it's all about fear why even try to wrestle with any theological question then why do you do what you do why does anyone who tries to study the why questions when it comes to god do what they do because the answer will always just go back to well, it doesn't matter. You either trust God or you burn in hell. A common enemy is a great way to unite people. A common enemy is a great way to take the blame off God. Any inconvenience in your life, you have someone to blame. Any evil in this world, you have someone to blame. Why did God make him? Because free will and also because of redemption, but also we can't know and also don't ask questions because you don't want to end up in hell. And besides, Satan is the one making you ask the questions in the first place. Listen, the devil's a liar. He's a deceiver. He will cheat you, deceive you any way he can to get you to follow him rather than Jesus. And so if he can create doubt in your mind about the word of God, that's a dangerous doubt. If he can create that doubt in your mind about his word, he, listen, he doesn't have a toehold. He's got a stronghold and a grip in your life. Because when you get tempted, here's what you'll do. You'll say, well, I believe, I believe the Bible, but some of it's not relevant. Which part is that? They rely on fear to make sure you don't question things. But guess what? These people and these doctrines don't have to control you anymore. Question away. Searching for the truth should never endanger the truth. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from watching it, send it their way. And as always, you're all wonderful. I love you so much. Have yourself a great day. Stay cool. Have some ice cream. You're the best. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs> I'm recording and I'm recording. I'm having a bad day. What the actual fuck? <laughs>